after the break. New rights if you're a renter, plus a climate warning and why London's flood prevention plans are being brought forward. Tonight, an accident waiting to happen. The court hears how survivors of the Croydon tram crash describe being flung about as if they were in a washing machine. Driver Alfred Doris denies falling asleep and failing to take reasonable care. Also ahead, the Met deny making political arrests in the run-up to the coronation as a Westminster Night Star volunteer speaks about her ordeal for the first time. I was interviewed at approximately one o'clock in the afternoon the following day and then we were released a little bit after four o'clock. Right, OK. I'm a bit speechless actually having heard that account. New rights for renters, but could government plans for reform actually make the capital's housing crisis worse? And act now, another climate warning as London's flood defence plan is brought forward. Good evening. It has been a long wait for answers for the families of those who died in the Croydon tram crash in 2016. But today, the man who is alleged to have fallen asleep while operating service 2551, causing it to derail, killing seven people and injuring 51 others, went on trial for the first time at the Old Bailey. The court heard that Alfred Doris was travelling at three times the speed limit before the disaster and that passengers inside were flung around as if in a washing machine when the tram came off the tracks. He denies failing to take reasonable care. With the latest, here's Carolyn Sim. As he arrived in court this morning, tram driver Alfred Doris, seen here in the middle, faced a single charge of failing to take reasonable care at work. And the families of the seven people who lost their lives would once again hear details about what happened. In the prosecution's opening statement, the jury was told Tram 2551 couldn't hope to hold the track as it took a bend at 70 kilometres per hour just after six o'clock on the morning of the 9th of November 2016. Too late to slow to 20 kilometres an hour to safely turn the corner. It was heard that the passengers inside were flung around as windows smashed and doors were ripped off. Those who died were thrown out and became trapped between the overturned tram and the track. To a silent court, their names were read out. In the aftermath of the crash, passengers recalled finding Doris with his eyes shut. It's alleged he suddenly opened them and said he must have blacked out or passed out. The court was told that when Mr Doris was interviewed, the repeated theme of his answers was that he'd become disorientated. In one response, he said, one minute I'm OK driving, and then the next just thinking, where am I? What's going on? He denied that he'd fallen asleep, and he denied having had a blackout while going through the tunnel. The prosecution said Mr Doris will claim his confusion was caused by external factors like lighting in the tunnel and signage on the approach to the bend. That Transport for London and Tram Operations Limited had also failed in their health and safety duties and that Mr Doris may even have fallen into a so-called micro-sleep. But the issue, the jury was told, was not whether the driver fell asleep but whether he took reasonable care for the health and safety of his passengers. Mr Doris denies the charge against him. The trial is expected to last five weeks. Carolyn Sim, ITV News, at the Old Bailey. Next, a Westminster Council Night Stars volunteer who was arrested by police during the King's coronation has spoken for the first time. Susie Melvin has been giving evidence to MPs at the Commons Home Affairs Committee where the police also denied they were under political pressure to detain demonstrators. While political correspondent Simon Harris is here. So, Simon, uh, tell us about what happened today then. Well, this was the first chance MPs had to question the Met about the coronation policing operation. There was, as you recall, some anger at the arrest of anti-monarchist demonstrators and the detention of those women's safety campaigners from the Night Stars. It's thought the police feared they might set off or that somebody might set off rape alarms to scare the horses during the royal procession. This is what Susie Melvin had to say. 
we did the best that we could to try and explain who we were to the officers um, and then they also searched the church that we um, based ourselves out of um, and we were then taken in police vans to, well, we were told we were going to be arrested and taken in police vans to Woolworth um, Police Station. Also giving evidence was Assistant Commissioner Matt Twiss who insisted the Met wasn't under political pressure to arrest demonstrators. I felt under no pressure politically. I felt pressure to deliver a safe and secure operation, but that was because of the fact it was a once-in-a-lifetime event for so many people and there would be hundreds of thousands of people in London to celebrate it. And also, and importantly, this was the biggest protection operation we have ever run. There were 312 protected people that we managed to get in and out of the Atvi and across the footprint. You might have noticed in the background there people wearing T-shirts. Well, they were from Just Stop Oil and inevitably, perhaps, decided to disrupt the proceedings. ...of the officers. You usually use a combination lock to stop... Oh, We're here today to become a democracy... Oh, come, on, officer. come on, come on, come on, officer. Security. Security. come on. Uh, back in session. Oh, Lord. To, to be clear, they were Just Stop Oil protesters who tried to undermine the activities of this committee uh, with our witnesses today. Uh, well, the live broadcast of the proceedings was suspended during that protest and you could hear there one MP saying, come on, police, or come on, officer, do your job. Yeah. All right, Simon, actually quite a lot happened today, didn't it? Uh, thank you. And our man who killed a beautician when he lost control of his Range Rover while showing off has been jailed for more than seven years. Rida Kazem was caught driving at speeds of up to 110 miles per hour on the A40 near Ealing before his car ploughed through a Tesla dealership and landed on the tracks at Park Royal Tube Station. Kazem had been driving two women home from a night out in August last year, one of whom was Yagma Osden, who died at the scene. And Brentford FC's Ivan Tony has been suspended for eight months with immediate effect for breaking the Football Association's betting rules. The club's forward admitted 232 breaches and was also fined £50,000. Players are prohibited from betting on any football match that takes place anywhere in the world. Now, it's no secret that there is a big shortage of rental properties across the capital, which has pushed average monthly payments to a record £2,500. But today, as the government outlined its rental reform bill, including measures to increase renters' rights, campaigners warn the changes could cause more landlords to sell up, making the housing shortfall worse. The new rules aim to make it harder to kick out tenants and easier for tenants to get properties if they have pets or children. Here's Rags Martel. So last winter, I started noticing that there was a lot of black mold growing here. She rents a home with mold and damp. But when Belinda Larnan complained, her landlord responded by putting the property on the market. Before my son went to school, he said, Mom, there's a for sale sign in the garden. And he got really worried because, uh, well, the GCSE started uh, this week. And he was like, that. this happened a few weeks ago. He was really stressed out about that. Kind of like, what's happening, you know? Sorry to keep oh, don't worry. But the government claims it's coming to help private renters like Belinda and Teddington by scrapping an old law brought in by Margaret Thatcher in 1988 called Section 21, No Fault Evictions. Belinda has a home that she loves and she's been there for a few years now. But she's had problems with her landlord and she's complained about the condition of her home. It's got damp, it's got mould. The landlord responded by threatening eviction. Now, that's completely wrong. The Renters' Reform Bill proposes to stop no-fault evictions. It'll also end landlords banning benefit claimants from renting their properties. And tenants will now be allowed pets, which landlords can't unreasonably refuse. While the Renters' Reform Bill gets rid of Section 21 no-fault evictions, housing campaigners are still worried that landlords will still be able to evict tenants by using other loopholes in the law. Rent hikes by landlords, for example, could become no-fault evictions under another name. There's nothing in this bill that's going to stop landlords from using big rent rises to force people out of their homes. So there's a real danger that the government's going to break its promise to end unfair evictions uh, unless it protects tenants from unfair rent hikes. And rents are rising to record levels. 
According to Rightmove, the average asking price to rent a London flat is more than £2,500 a month. And there's no shortage of renters. This property in Shadwell Heath, East London, had a queue of viewings going down the street. I think what most Londoners want is a housing system for our city that prioritises all of us having a decent place to live over the profits of landlords. Well, it's very stressful to find another house in the current market. The new law comes too late to help Belinda, but it could eventually bring some much needed protection to London's renters. Rags Martel, ITV News. Let's take a deeper look at this now with housing campaigner Quajo Twinaboa. Um, Quajo, thank you very much for joining me. There's quite a lot to unpick with all this, isn't it? I mean, on the face of it, the government is saying that these new potential laws offering protection for renters, so banning no-fault evictions, stopping landlords, denying tenancies to people who've got pets or children, it's on the face of it a good thing. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I think tenants up and down the country were absolutely relieved mm. to see. I mean, it's something that's been years in the making and people have been absolutely screaming for it. I mean, no fault evictions, especially in the last year, it's gone up by 143%. There's absolutely no reason in my eyes why a landlord should be able to evict a tenant without any genuine reasoning. And that's what this bill sets out to do. It doesn't say landlords aren't allowed to evict tenants. It says they should have specific and valid reasonings in order to yeah. evict them. Um, there is a particular issue, though, and we've seen in the capital, and it's getting worse and worse, and that is just the sheer cost of rent, how much it costs people mm. to rent now. This doesn't really address that problem, and it doesn't really address a shortage of housing, mm. which is underlying and underpinning everything. Absolutely, moment. and that's what we need. We need more homes, fundamentally. Mm. We simply don't have enough demand, outstrips supply um, massively, and what we're seeing is we don't currently have any sort of rent caps, mm. and rent is absolutely ridiculous. I think the average price for a room at the moment in London is £1,000. I've mm. spoken to people paying £1,500 for rooms and they're paying majority of their monthly income renting from landlords and I think that's what we need to remember too when we're having these conversations. Yeah, and there is something we saw in Iraq's uh, report there as well. There is this concern that if you're putting you know, the onus on landlords or restricting landlords, then they, they're going to be just put off really. They're going to get rid of these, they're going to get rid of the properties and that's going to just make that shortage even worse, isn't it? Well, there has been that point and mm. I think people have been panicking a lot because of the word regulation. Yes. But what this um, sector has lacked is regulation. Mm. It simply hasn't had any. The fact that we haven't had an ombudsman in the private sector yeah. um, shocks me. So it's great that we're getting that. And in terms of uh, landlords, there may be some that leave, but there's always going to be more landlords to yeah. replace them and rent out the property. You talk about the ombudsman and uh, we, Michael Gove has also mm. spoken about that today, but that is not going to help people like Belinda, who we saw in, in RAG's report, because it, it's too late for her. So what about people who are struggling right now? What is your advice to them? Well, absolutely. I think the government definitely needs to go further, especially when it comes to rent. And this is something that I've been saying for a very long time in the the, the private sector because it's simply unaffordable, especially during a cost of living crisis. And yes, I understand that landlords' mortgages are increasing, but what we do know is that landlords out there using Section 21 as an absolute weapon and profiting off of a necessity that people need, and that's a roof over their head. Um, so it is a very difficult times at the moment. Yeah, well, listen, Quajo Twinibo, it's a, it's a very big issue. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people having to deal with in London. Thank you so much for Thank your you thoughts on it. Thank you. And if you are still confused by the renters' reform bill and how it might affect you, there is a full explainer and breakdown on our website, itv.com slash London. Still to come on the programme, including... He found fame on Britain's Got Talent in dance group Pulse, but now Glenn Murphy's opening up about his struggles off-camera and... I'm at the Thames Barrier where we'll be talking about flooding and hot temperatures. Hard to imagine when it's dry and a little bit chilly here. I'll also have the full forecast very soon. But first, a former Metropolitan Police officer who allegedly missed an opportunity to properly investigate murder at Wayne Cousins over two incidents of flashing has been giving evidence at a misconduct hearing in Southwark. Samantha Lee is accused of failing to make the correct investigative inquiries following an incident involving female members of staff at a McDonald's restaurant in Swanley. Well, Helen Keenan is at New Scotland Yard for us this evening. Helen, what more was said today? Well, this is the third day of the hearing involving Ms Lee and it's the first day that she 
has given evidence. Now, we know that Wayne Cousins exposed himself to female staff at a McDonald's restaurant in Kent. Now, Ms Lee was sent to interview the branch's manager. He says that he showed her CCTV of one of the incidents. Ms Lee gave evidence saying the footage had been automatically deleted and that she 100% did not see any CCTV footage. Now, that meant that they didn't have an image of the suspect who turned out to be Wayne Cousins. And just a few hours after that, Wayne Cousins went on to kidnap and murder Sarah Everard in Clapham. Now, at the hearing today, we heard more from Ms Lee that in the days after, she was on her assigned rest days. Now, that was also when Cousins was arrested. When she returned to work, she was said that she was astonished to hear that these incidents of indecent exposure that she had been looking at initially had not been assigned to someone more senior and that a supervisor after her shift should have done that. She said that I was shocked. I could not believe that the crime report would be still shown to me, believing that it would have been transferred to the My Investigation Support Team. Of course, had I known or been aware that it had not been transferred, I would have transferred it or spoken to a supervisor about getting it transferred. Now, Ms Lee denies all the allegations against her about breaching the force's standards in her duties and integrity. Now, if she is found to have committed gross misconduct, that means that she could be banned from serving on the force we understand that Ms Lee will continue giving her evidence at the hearing tomorrow. All right, Helen at News Scotland Yard, thank you. Now our next guest captured the hearts of the nation as one half of a South London Street Act pulse on Britain's Got Talent in 2010. Here's a reminder. <laughs> But despite finishing as he runs up behind it all, Glenn Murphy was struggling with his mental health and he's now opening up about his experiences as part of Mental Health Awareness Week. And I'm very pleased to say that Glenn joins us now. Glenn, I remember watching that. that How crazy. old were you there? Uh, 19. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so, 2010. So in incredibly young. But to, and to come runners up on one of the biggest shows on telly at the time, what was that whole experience like? It was crazy. It was a whirlwind. And we went back for 2019 for the Champions Edition. And obviously, yeah. that's just taken it to a whole other level. Yeah. yeah. Um, of course, you know, yeah, it all looks very lovely and glossy when you, when you watch these shows on TV. Um, but behind the cameras, for you, there was some Something else going on so tell, tell us where you were at at that point yeah and that's what's hard because it was kind of the biggest high of my life but I was also going through the biggest low in my mm -hmm. personal life I was struggling with anxiety and depression mm -hmm. through a few layered things going on in, in my it's life and I was yeah, really I'm struggling really to speak about it and then yeah. going on to TV and having this front of this is the most exciting day ever yeah. knowing that I'm gonna go home and feel how I was feeling so that must be so strange having to like you said go out there and and perform but when you're really mentally feeling incredibly low. Yeah, it was exhausting. And I yeah. think that's what, it took a long time for me to get to a point where I felt like I could say it. I felt quite embarrassed to speak to mm. people. I felt quite just worried of what people were gonna think because of what they could see on TV. And it's interesting that you say you felt quite embarrassed then because that was back in 2010. This is, would be 2023, a lot yeah. of time has passed. Do you think attitudes have changed considerably since then? We are much more open, aren't we, in how we talk about mental health and we address it as we do our physical health as well, don't we? Definitely, I think it's, it's definitely getting better, but I think mm. men specifically yeah. are struggling so, so much, which is why I wanted to create a campaign and, yeah. and get guys on board to get talking. And uh, part of that campaign, actually, you're working with the charity Mind. Yes. And you've got a single, we're going to just play some of the music video and you can talk to us about the song while we're playing it. So just, um, when we, let's have a little look, just have a little look now. Um, but just tell us, um, yeah, exactly, what, what is the song called and what particular issues are you addressing? Yeah, so the song's called Made It Out Alive and the idea behind the campaign is called hashtag can't say it, post it. Mm. So throughout the video you'll see I'm writing down post-it notes of fears, struggles, worries and putting them all on my wall to kind of really put a, a name on what I'm feeling. Yeah. And the campaign is to get guys to just write down one thing and to hold it up. And that's just really putting a finger on, this is how I'm feeling right now. And maybe someone close to you can see that and go, I didn't know you was going to go through that. Yeah. And the things I've seen so far and the things guys are writing, they're so surprised to know how many people 
are resonating and connected with that and the song's kind of just a vehicle for that really. Well listen, it's a really good idea and Glenn, it's so nice to, to chat to you now all these years later and you're you. definitely, out, you're in a better place aren't you? Yeah, I'm, I'm working for it, it's like yeah. they say, I'm managing it now and this is good because it feels like a brotherhood, the more these men that get involved and talk, it will join in each other, well, so it's great. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you so Thanks, much. Glenn. Well, there's details of support if you're struggling with your mental health at itv.com slash London. All right, Sally is down by the Thames for us this evening. And Sally, listen, usually we love a chat and a laugh about the weather, but actually some serious warnings today about water levels in the capital and potential impacts of global warming in London. That's right, Lucrezia. It's hard when you're standing here with the high walls on the other side of the Thames. In fact, I'm on a flood defence here. We've got the huge Thames barrier there and further flood defences upstream in places like Fulham and Teddington. It's hard to imagine London flooding, but without these working properly, they could. And what we heard today is that the flood defences further upstream towards London are going to be raised 15 years earlier than they initially wanted to. And the reason for that is climate change. Climate change, of course, leads to sea levels rising and increased extreme weather events such as flooding. Now, these defences protect 1.4 million people in the capital and billions of pounds worth of London's infrastructure. So let's hear from another Sally now from the Environment Agency. Most people do know that the Thames barrier is there to protect London from flooding, but it can only do that as part of a wider system of walls and embankments. In fact, we're standing on a flood um, embankment right now, and it's about raising the levels of those embankments that's going to be really important and bring forward. So it works as a whole ecosystem protecting London and the estuary from flooding. We'll have more on global warming and temperatures in the national news. But for now, let's take a little look at the weather. Here we go. ITV London weekday weather is sponsored by Octopus Electric Vehicles. Car, charger and energy. Well, I don't know about you, but it's certainly not outdoor swimming weather yet, despite the uh, uh, bits of warmth we've got. But the pelicans look pretty keen. Now, as we go through to tomorrow, there will hopefully again be some uh, nice warmth in the sunshine. But we have got cloud around uh, and possibly a shower here or there, but most of us staying dry. Into Friday, things a bit more unsettled. We could get uh, some more showers cropping up, maybe even a thunderstorm here or there. But we'll keep you posted on that because there's a bit of uncertainty. As for tonight, a fair bit of cloud out here and we'll probably hold on to quite a bit more cloud overnight compared to the last few nights and that will stop things getting quite as cold so a few areas staying up into double figures overnight and therefore tomorrow morning when you wake up it won't be quite as fresh there could well be some early cloud but as we go through the day that'll start to break up to allow some sunshine through and then once again a bit more cloud heading our way through the day into the afternoon and as I said mostly dry maybe a shower cropping up here or there uh, you can see from the east it's a touch cooler a little bit of an easterly breeze but temperatures doing pretty well highs of 18 to 20 and into the evening very similar setup it could just catch a shower to the north but most people again staying dry so friday looks more unsettled but it is picking up into the weekend that's the weather here's the pollen itv london weekday weather is sponsored by octopus electric vehicles hello summer piri sponsors itv pollen count Now, most people with uh, hay fever are allergic to grass pollen. Because the season's just getting going, the levels are pretty low at the moment, but there is still moderate to high levels of oak pollen. That's it from me here by the Thames. Cheerio. And finally, through the People's Projects, you are being given the chance to help decide where thousands of pounds of national lottery funding is spent. Every night this week, we've been showcasing a project that hopes to improve the lives of their community. Well, the People's Projects is a partnership between ITV and the National Lottery Community Fund. And tonight, we're featuring the work of Songs and Smiles, who bring together the young and old to tackle loneliness and build bonds among some unlikely friends. So Songs and Smiles started up as a grassroots project when I was on maternity leave with my eldest. 
I used to take my little boy to visit his great great auntie in her care home. And I'd walk into the residence lounge and there'd be people sitting there, maybe dozing, maybe watching the television. And we'd walk in and ding, it was like a light had come on. And I found it really therapeutic chatting to people who said, look, we remember the sleepless nights and the teething, but actually the thing that really sticks with you is the cuddles and the snuggles, and those are the things that you remember. Oh, it's lovely. And when they had these bubbles today, I said, I've got to pack it. I've got a granddaughter, so I said, I've got to get a pack, one of those. <laughs> yeah, it was lovely, and the little ones, they just loved them, didn't they? Oh, I loved the bubbles and the little ones. And seeing the children, that hopefully it will grow and it will be good. If we get enough votes and we win the money, then Songs and Smiles comes back to East London and we're going to run Songs and Smiles in five different care homes for a year, bringing so many children and parents, guardians and older people together every single week. Um, if we don't get enough votes, we don't have the money and Songs and Smiles doesn't happen. It's, it's as simple as that, and which is just quite heartbreaking. So first of all, if you're a child, do you think you could hide yourself? Yeah. Where is Headley Peekaboo? Peekaboo to Headley. It's changed my life, giving my children the experience of kind of meeting other people that they wouldn't meet day to day and just coming into a home. And the homes, they're like, the huge families, they all work together, they all kind of, everybody's so caring and it became like my safe space to come to each week. People come to us and they feel that joy and they kind of, they take it with them and they spread it. And um, it's, yeah, just a little special bit of magic, really. Well, the three projects with the most votes will receive a grant of up to £70,000 and the runners-up will be awarded up to £10,000. To vote, go to itv.com slash the People's Projects. Voting closes at 12 noon on Friday the 26th of May. You can only vote once per region and you'll need an email address or mobile phone number to vote. Terms and conditions and privacy notice can be found on the website. And that is it from us for now. Mary's back at 6.30 with the ITV Evening News. But from us for now, from all of us on the London team, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye.